Hi, everyone. I'm Susan Clinton, and this is the pre-pre-podcast um, uh, message from Tough to Treat. I'm here with Erica Mello, and we have some announcements to make about those of you who have been so kind to leave us great reviews. Erica, do you want to tell us what you found on the review sheet to talk yeah, about today? Absolutely. And thank you, everybody, once again, for leaving us a testimonial. Uh, we do read them all, and um, it, it's, really, it, it, it's, it's really very gracious of all of you to listen and, and, and to leave us these testimonials. So I'm just going to read a few, and then we're going to pick a winner for the webinar. So here is one from uh, called Inspiring Podcast by T-A-F-P-T. Uh, I absolutely love li listening to these two PTs talk out their treatment approach to a variety of patients. I have been a PT for seven years and work in a like-minded setting, but I appreciate how this podcast makes me think more about my patient treatment and inspires me to try new things. I also really appreciate having female mentorship in this profession. So thank you so much for, for that one. And the next one is Always Teaching and Learning by New WWF. This podcast stands out from other PT podcasts as these clinicians are well experienced, provide detailed steps of clinical reasoning. By far my favorite PT podcast. And lastly, by JL All 52, this podcast is the real deal. There is so much to learn from these experts. I highly recommend this for any physical therapist and healthcare professional. Learn to think outside the box, and I always take away great tips and a broader way of thinking about pain and movement. And she talks about in her headline about the unique biopsychosocial approach as well. So we have picked a winner, and the drum roll, we don't have a drum roll, the winner is to get access to our webinar is JL All 52. So though that's the, all the information that we have on you. So you need to email one of us to let us know that you, that you have listened to the podcast and that you are the winner because we don't know how to reach you. So you can email me either at erica at ericamello.com or susan at susan at embody-pt.com. So if we do not hear from the winner from JLL52 within two weeks, we will pick another one. Sound we'll also, good? yes, and we'll also announce it in our Facebook, in our Facebook, Facebook group. group. Thank you very much, everybody. Enjoy Thanks, the podcast. Hi, everybody. This is Erica Mello, and welcome to episode number 74 of Tough to Treat. And this is entitled, Does Scapula Stabilization Always Work? This, it, not always, <laughs> this is about a patient of mine who suffered a T1 avulsion fracture, had surgery to remove the fragment, and really wasn't much better, to be honest. He, uh, we always talk about motor patterning and movement strategies on the podcast, and I'm a firm believer that if the, if the motor pattern is there preoperatively, and if it's not serving the person, it's not going away postoperatively. Generally, you need to train a new movement strategy, and uh, this particular patient was a, a weightlifter, a serious weightlifter, not competitive, but very much into the 400-pound deadlift squats, the Olympic lift, and uh, whether he, was, he got the avulsion fracture from that or or, or somewhere else really was unknown. Uh, he just sort of woke up one day and had this searing pain in his upper back, and. He had you know, been to his therapist uh, before, and they were doing scap stabilization and, and, and shrugs, and he was not getting any better. So, you know, he had this very typical weightlifter's posture, you know, very broad back, drooped shoulders, really depressed scapula, sort of very, very common in, in that group. And uh, as of this airing, or as of this recording, I have yet to see him in person. I have treated him virtually from the get-go and so we had a lot of fun with this episode and, and it really goes to show you you know the power of telehealth and the power of using your computer screen as your mirror and as your friend and 
I took screenshots and, and uh, I, I really zoomed in on them. And there are a lot of things that, that you can't do in the clinic uh, with, your, with your computer. So really, it's a very powerful tool. And uh, we, we really enjoyed doing this episode. So I hope you all enjoy it. And Susan and I are going to be coming out with a webinar very soon. We're in the process of just um, editing it. And it's really about you know, uh, how we treat complex patients. And we hope you, uh, hope you get a chance to take a look. Thank you and enjoy. Hi, everybody. This is Erica Mello, and I'm with my lovely co host, Susan Clinton, and welcome to Tough to Treat. I am actually hi. just looking up. What, sorry, Susan, go ahead. Sorry I about say that. Hi. <laughs> Hi. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just looking up uh, our podcast number. I want to say this, this is almost 70, gosh, I almost want to say 74 or 75. Um, it's, it, we've been doing a lot here. We've been still at home, uh, you know, on and off, and uh, we've been doing a lot. I would want to say this is probably 70, 75. Um, if that's incorrect, I apologize. <laughs> so uh, it is my turn today, and I'm going to talk about a patient that I assess virtually. So I've had, um, uh, you know, the opportunity to do some see some new patients in this virtual setting, and I have to say, Susan, that I'm wearing my glasses a lot more um, because my eyes are getting strained. But the I'm really getting my visual skills like honing in on my visual skills. And yeah. I think yeah. you, know, you can go right a little crazy, like I'm screenshotting. And, 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 and I almost want to, when I go back into the clinic, I think I'm actually going to still use photos because for me, um, it's a good way to still train the visual because sometimes the, the, the hands, I mean, we always want to use our hands, but we need to train them both and to see mm -hmm. if we see what we feel and feel what we see. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, uh, coach's eye and just taking pictures works really well. Yeah, that's right. I forgot about that. Mm -hmm. eye. Um, perfect. That's it's an awesome. easy, easy app to use because when you're looking at real time movement, you can slow them down. That's you know, right. you can, you can film, you can record their movement, but then you can slow it down frame by frame. Can, can you draw on it as well? Uh huh. Oh, I like that. Okay. That's, that's because I've been drawing lines and it's been really fascinating for me. I've been mm -hmm. kind of going a little overboard, <laughs> but it's, 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 it's been a learning experience. So um, this is a young boy that I treat. He's, he's 20 and he has, uh, his medical history uh, is not long, uh, but he came to see me with some upper, upper sort of thoracic tightness and some right-sided neck pain uh, worse with uh, right rotation of the head and looking down. And he had a history, he had, a, he had an avulsion fracture at T1. And it, his symptoms, start, he couldn't really pinpoint the exact time uh, of the symptoms or the exact time that he occurred because he went to the doctor sort of well after the symptoms started. So he was a, he's a big weightlifter. So he had probably about 300 pounds on a squat rack and literally just did a squat and felt like the shooting pain in his upper back. And he stopped and he, a couple months went by, got a little bit better with rest. He ended up trying to go back into the gym and it, it got, just sort of came back. So he went to see the doctor. They found an avulsion fracture at T1. He's, the doctor's like, look, I can remove it. I, I, you can keep it. I mean, it's not going to make it worse if I get rid of the, the segment, the the piece that's that's evolved so they did they had surgery this past august for that his history includes a fall i asked him this these quoting your famous questions you know what do you think's going on <laughs> when did you think it started right so he told me he felt it started with a fall off a skateboard at the age of 12 so the eight years ago fell onto his left arm uh broke his uh broke his ribs probably couldn't take a real deep breath after that. So I'm assuming he had a rib fracture. It, it was not x-rayed, just his elbow was x-rayed. Okay. Um, he also has a history of um, some shin splints on his, on both of his legs in, in high school, left worse than right. He actually ran track. He said he ran track, but he actually did a shot put in discus. So that was more of his sort of his, his movement history. 
he's young, so he doesn't have a ton of injuries except the fall off the skateboard. Um, that was pretty much it in terms of injuries. Uh, I asked him what I thought. I said, what do you think's going on? And he's mm-hmm. like, I think it's muscle guarding. It's just a, 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 a muscle imbalance. Mm. Okay. That's what, he, that's what he felt. He had been to physical therapy preoperatively down where he goes to school did not you know get better really and that's why they did the surgery obviously and then he went post-operatively and they did a lot of um scap stabilization mostly things in prone uh didn't get better so he still really had symptoms post-op so that's the the, the, the the surgery didn't really do much for the symptoms uh so he went to another place down there and they and he said he, they did a few things differently he felt a little bit better but not like where he should be so I'm like, what did they do differently? And he's like, they did, you know, some things like shrugs and things like this. And I was like, oh, okay. So his main complaint was this tightness, T1, T2, T3, with forward bending of his head. And when he turns his head to the right, a lot of this upper sort of, you know, scalene, SCM tightness in through there. And that really was, um, that, that was his, those were his chief complaints. So when I actually took a look at him, um, I decided that I was going to look at forward bending and rotation. Okay. So he did an exercise the prior weekend that I saw him. So he ended up doing something like a face pull in, 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 in the, in his, in his home and he couldn't lift his arm up, but that was not why he, you know, so that was just one of these, I did an exercise and it aggravated my shoulder and now I can't lift my arm up. That was a short term acute thing. He, when he contacted me, he was able to lift his arm up. So that's how he presented the first, the first visit. And so when I tell you, when I saw him, so I'm doing this all virtually. So I tend to assess in the virtual setting, uh, you know, a lot more in the, in the, in the clinic. So I look I looked at, you know, his forward bending of his neck, bilateral cervical spine rotation, um, thoracic rotation and sitting and kneeling. Uh, I had him do a squat just because he wants to go back to squatting. I also had him do, do a single arm lift and a bilateral arm lift. So those are the movements that I assess. But I will tell you, and this is what I wanted to get to, I took a look at him in standing. And I, all I remember, I remember when I was out in St. Louis doing one of Shirley Sarman's courses, she talked about like these down sloping shoulders. When I tell you, his, the, his po- the view posteriorly, his shoulders and scapula were so depressed and dumped in downward rotation, I... I mean, I could not take my eyes off that part of his body. It was so apparent. And he, it's ironic because he said to me today, he's like, you know, do you think my neck is long? I'm like, no, it's just your shoulders are so dropped. That's what you, you think it is. So he had this sort of typical weightless weightlifters uh, stance, sort of retracted scapula, anterior humeral you know, glide, if you want to go with Shirley's words, you know, she's like, like, you know, they're sort of bringing their shoulders back, they're sticking their chest out, their scaps are retracted, dumped, and they're perfect posture. Like you took a plumb line, if you took a plumb line up from the middle of his feet to up to his head, he'd be like center of mass would be equal on both. He was like this rigid, broad back posture. But it was, it was this, these, these dumped or depressed shoulders that really caught my eye and he is a, he wants to weight lift he, he's been as high as 400 pounds on his back doing a squat so do you have any questions about anything or mm-hmm. I, I wanted to ask I'm gonna okay so I did ask him I said do you have digestive problems and do you have heart palpitations and he said yes to both of those mm-hmm. because I'm thinking you know once again you know, looking at his, I mean, this is actually before I even sort of took a look at him in standing. Those, I tend to ask the heart palpitation question a lot more now. Um, The digestion I always ask, but the heart palpitation I've been asking more. Um, And he is young and, you know, young to really have those heart palpitations. So uh, I had him do a couple of movements and I had him just do neck rotation. When he looked down in, in sitting, he was fine. He turned his head to the right. He had this sort of upper upper thoracic, upper, I'm sorry, upper neck tightness. I had him go into standing and had him look down and I had him do it in, in, in neck rotation and standing versus sitting to see if there was a difference. And there wasn't. So his forward bending was good on that particular day. That was something he's complained about. He said, no, it feels fine today. 
and it's been fine ever since. So I've seen him a few times virtually. So the main issue was this right rotation and also this, this arm lift that could, that was, that was just short term aggravated. And then his left arm was pretty, pretty good. His seated trunk rotation was fine. His left seated trunk rotation was a bit limited, I will tell you, in, um, in both kneeling and in sitting. So it wasn't like it was functional, but it was just a little bit limited versus the right side. I had him stand and do a squat. He squatted, he went over to the right. He, once again, you know, not unusual. And he wanted to go back to squatting. And I wanted to see what he looked like without weight on his hand. So because I don't have the hands and because I, I'm looking at this upper back and I'm looking at this, these, the, the dumped and the downwardly rotated, I'm thinking, you know, right off the bat, the lats are probably just so jacked up tight that he probably can't even lift his arm above his head without, you know, without sort of extending his lumbar spine or extending his thoracic spine because he can't, he doesn't have the mobility in his shoulders. So I want your thoughts on that. And then what we can, because I've treated him a couple of times and I wanted to share your, your thoughts. Yeah. Well, um, I want to know, was this guy tall? Yes. Big hands, big feet. Um, not big feet. Okay. Um, big hands. I don't know. I didn't notice it. Is he lanky? Like, is he is he tall and lanky? Is he? Yeah. He's got like this sort of very narrow waist and very sort of V-like back, like a swimmer. So very uh -huh. narrow, tall. Actually, somewhat tall. Yeah. So mm -hmm. tall, and then just sort of up like this. Okay, and he does yeah, have that broad then, back. And yes. you said that he stands with his chest jutted forward. Yeah, like yeah, like this. So you know, like okay. this. Yeah. Sorry, I think he's thinking we're on like you know a video. He's got like jutting that chest out, so to speak. Yeah. All weightlifters do. And and did he look hypermobile? Did he seem hypermobile? Did he? Um, knees, he, hips, anything? So his upper extremity, a little bit. Not his hips. Definitely not his hips. Okay. Uh, but he's been his, lifting a while too. So. Yes, correct. He's pretty tight in his hamstrings, his calves, very common, right? But but not, I mean, if, you, if I had to say yes, I'd say a little bit hypermobile, but not overtly. I would say it would be joint specific, not an overly hypermobile person. Um, so I have my suspicions, but I'll let you move along. Okay. So um, I'm going to move to the next. So what I, what I did is I did some cueing with him because I can't get in there and sort of modify his head position or his shoulder position or his scapular position. I had him cue. So what I did was because neck rotation and the arm lift at that time was meaningful for him, that, that's what I assessed it. Uh, so uh, what I assessed further, I mean. So I had him just imagine, do some imagery in the neck. Imagine you've got a hook in between the vertebrae and you're making yourself two inches taller. Uh, imagine you are, you, you know, uh, also I had him do like, I had him Im like do an image of, of each vertebrae and just imagine you're giving yourself space and making yourself lengthen from your sternum. And so that was that he was able to get at that from, cause he knew where the mm -hmm. sternum was. So, uh, and then I said, keep that image, turn your head to the right, turn your head to the left, lift your arm up and let's see, let's see. If, if that's better. And he wanted to know why I was doing that. I said, because I'm not in the clinic and, tr and, and trying to modify your head position, I'm giving, I'm trying to assess whether the, Im the impact of whether I can treat your neck, the impact of that potentially on other regions of your body. So the imagery will help me do that. It, it, the imagery will help me, will settle some of the muscle tone around your neck and, 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 and get that. So he understood that. So when I had him do the cueing, his arm, his neck rotation was better. It should have been. And then his arm rotation was, excuse me, his arm lift was okay. It, was, it wasn't like 100% great. So then I did the same thing lower down, okay? I did the same thing in the thorax. I said, imagine mm -hmm. you're going to float your shoulder blades. And I had him turn his head. I had him lift his arm. That was all significantly better. I then had him sit and put his arms on to unload his shoulder blades on like a bunch of pillows. And so that's obviously going to give him a more sort of stable shoulder girdle platform. Then I just had him turn his head to the right, to the left, and then I had him lift his arm up. And that was the same as the thoracic cueing, which is floating your shoulder blades up. So I gave him the image of almost like an upwardly rotated scapula. So having said that, and that this eval was taking uh, 
a bit, not as long as my first virtual with Al for sure. So I ended up giving him on the first visit because then I had him, actually I take that back, sorry. I had him do some squatting and I had him to put his feet on a half, uh, like uh, pillows to see if taking his feet out would, would help his squat. And it did, it centered him almost a hundred percent. So, which makes sense. Cause I think he has a secondary foot issue. I'm finding the secondary feet issues. So, 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 so often now. Um, so the first visit I made the hypothesis that he, there's some, some loss of control um, up in his, in his thorax. So I gave him some basic uh, breath work uh, to do with some, um, just some, some seated arm, just lying on your back to stabilize the scapula and literally just had him do some breath work, lifting his arms up and down. Then I had him just easily take like a, a five pound weight and, and like one five pound weight and link it between your two hands and just do some tricep extensions. That's what I did. That's all I did because it was, it was a long visit. Um, and then he came back and he's, he's feeling better. Um, I then, get, so I'm going to combine the, the, the visit I did today and then the visit from last time. So I taught him how to release muscles between his shoulder girdle and his ribs by just lying on his back and doing some, uh, no weight in his hand, just doing an arm lift and some reverse flies and elbow lift with breathing, lateral costal breathing. Mm-hmm. So, right, just to release any kind of vectors in, in there or muscles, excuse me. Then I taught him how to release his lats because his lats, like, you know, he was looking at, I took some screenshots of him after and I was like, his lats were super tight. You could even see it. So I had him go into an all fours position. Uh, and then I had him just sort of flex his, flex his spine up and try to keep or, or flex to neutral. And then I had him go back into all, you know, onto his heels as far as he can go without arching his back. So to try to, so to, to see if he could, if he was compensating with his lats. So the lats, once they kick in, they're going to start to pull the low back into that lower dosis. So mm-hmm. he couldn't go very far. So his lats were super, he said he really felt the pulling in his lats. So I said, both of them. So I said, that they're probably super tight. You know, just do that movement, all fours down, just, you know, because he wasn't really, he's not like one of these people who's going to really understand like the whole body and doesn't have a good mm-hmm. body and so I said go down halfway and come back that's where I'm seeing you lose that 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 neutral I also said you could also go in standing put a ball under your arm and just roll up and down on the wall you know do it mm-hmm. on both sides so that's what I that's what I gave him and then I started so I'm going to stop and you if you have any questions to any any more any questions at all <laughs> well I, what I'm what I'm hearing is that uh elongation getting them out of compression makes him feel a lot better and that makes sense, especially if the guy's loading a lot all the time. But it also seems that something's driving this um, down sloping shoulder compression into the thoracic spine, which I think is probably one of the drivers into his his neck. But I'm just wondering, he, you said, did, did he have any other injuries besides falling off his skateboard when he was a kid? Did he have um, any car wrecks or hit his head or? No. No. Okay. So nothing that would make you suspect any kind of upper cervical, um, something from trauma, just no, being just held. Fall, yeah, just to fall off the skateboard when he was 12. So that eight uh-huh. years prior. Um, no. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And um, I, think I, I, asked, I think I asked you this on Facebook Live. This guy's not Scandinavian, is he? No. Um, but he's a white guy, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, cause my concern for him at this age and all the things that you're doing are great and he should be doing for sure. You know, it's, it's not that you're off track or anything with him at all. My concern is that he's having heart palpitations and he's got digestive problems. Mm-hmm. Um, at 20 years of age, especially mm-hmm. the heart piece. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's making me think autoimmune with him. Yeah. And I'm just really wondering if this guy has uh, uh, either uh, ankylosing spondylitis or maybe even something like Marfan's. Right, right. So he was referred by my primary care doctor. And I did mention that, actually. Um, yeah, was, after we said, talked on Facebook on Live. On Facebook Live, exactly. So he, I've not heard back, um, but he, I, I agree. I mean, it's not, you know, he's, 
20. Um, I asked the heart palpitations because if they haven't been worked, if let's say they've been worked up, okay, which this guy hasn't been worked up for cardio, right. but a lot of athletes do, and they don't, they still have heart palpitations. A lot of it is some dysfunction in the thoracic. That's a that's a visceral right. or a mechanical referral. Right. Right. So for him, uh, he he has not been worked up. So and he didn't he didn't have any chest deformities. He has the pectus excavatus. Okay, because that there you go. So yeah. that is really closely associated with. Uh, syncope and heart palpitations yeah yeah he actually mentioned that to me on the second visit and i saw that virtually and mm -hmm. he's like my mother and i have this pectus excavatus yeah yeah and, yeah you know, so it's not something that was created from uh, a rib fracture when he was a kid and he just grew funny because that was gonna be my second thought well maybe he yeah. just grew funny because he fell and uh had an elbow fracture hard enough to hit his elbow probably you know uh, maybe even had a hairline of his ribs and they may have grown funny, you know, when you're yeah. a kid and you do something like that. But if his mother has it and he has it, I don't know. It sounds to me like there's a little autoimmunity working, you know, yeah. running around in the background here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that, I don't know. I just, that's to me, that's kind of coming up with all my little radars is like, yeah, yeah. this really needs to be addressed. I think yeah, especially I if he's having heart stuff. Yeah, I asked him about that today. And you hear that, about, you know, young athletes having strokes all the time or yeah, just sudden death, you know, from yeah. heart stuff that's often poo-pooed or missed or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it's like, ah. yeah. good. Okay, yeah. So you're talking to this PCP about it and everything. Yeah, I know. He, he's, a, he's a good guy. I know him well. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, you know, I agree. I mean, it's it, – but it was it's so interesting because he uh, – not an emotional guy either, very flat affect, um, very nice person. Um, but it just not a real like jovial personality type. And that's okay. Uh -huh. That's not, not unusual. Mm -hmm. So, um, so for him, what I ended, what I, so let's, let's assume, let's just assume for the sake of the conversation that he's been worked up and whatever. Okay. But I agree with you there. I do. Um, and that's why I ask about heart palpitations. I ask it all the time now. And, right. Right. Um, and because of, of that reason. So, what what was interesting for me is because he's a weightlifter and what weightlifters do is the minute they get that they're under the squat rack they get that barbell on their back in order to set their their system or their upper their shoulder girdle they literally retract they downwardly row they depress they stick their chest out and that's how they start to lift and that's what he's done so he's already put his system in a non optimal less efficient position to to load that weight yeah already, I mean, bad enough that yes. he had an avulsion fracture i know and he, so, so it's just it was a straw that broke the camel's back i mean i it's well, been it's, the, the thing is here for me is that it's feeding into this uh uh um uh chest wall issue mm -hmm, um mm -hmm. you know because you see that a lot with that downward sloping shoulders and that kind of thing and so part of that may be driven by the fact that that's just how his chest wall is but um yeah. he's you know the, the, i'm sure you're working on strategies for weightlifting with him but he's got to get out of that uh that's oh, not gonna, that's not going to be a a uh, no. a posture for him if he wants to keep loading because all he's doing is really and at 20 the, he's still growing yeah you yeah. know this is when men put on you know young you know well teenage boys turn into men. I mean, you know, in the next four years, he's going to be putting on massive amounts of bone, you know, and especially spinal, you know, this yep. is like, and so if he's got digestive problems and a fracture, yeah. <laughs> you know, know. It, you know, he, he may not be mineralizing, you know, his bones well enough. And at this age at 20, if he's going to do that, yeah. Boy, he really needs to be sure he's getting all the right stuff in and that he's absolutely actually absorbing it all. Yeah. Um, and in addition to the postural changes and the loading change, yeah, it, and really getting to get in yeah. a better, better position or a different position, maybe not better, but one that's going to be more optimal for him that, so he doesn't go into another fracture when he, he loads heavy. Mm -hmm. But you know, those are, those are kind of my red flags. It's like, I'd like for this guy to keep loading too. And I want him to, but with these other kinds of things in mind. Yeah, no, I agree. I think that mm -hmm. he needs to be, he's since because of his age group, because of his history, um, all of those things need to be taken into account. And I agree. I think that, um, you know, it's not just the physical, it's, it's, right. it's you know, visceral and everything. And I agree. So um, he, and, but I said to him, I said, you know, 
no matter what your issue is, you're, if, you, if you're going to take, pull up a barbell and you're going to still do that same strategy, you're going to set yourself up for another injury, if not neck pain, you know? So he, um, he said, well, why didn't the therapy help me before? I'm like, because they were feeding into a strategy. You're on your yeah. tummy doing scap exercises. They're feeding into a movement strategy that works for you. That's really mm -hmm. easy. The shrugs, he said the shrugs helped. I said they would, but they were doing them in the wrong positions. So they had him doing them like in sitting and on his back. So what I started doing with him, and this is why I wanted to, to bring him up, is that I took him, I literally had him just for an assessment. I just had him sit against his back against the door. You know, his tie hamstrings were so tight. I was like, just put a pillow under there. And I said, just put your arms out in front. Really keep your butt and your back right, right flush up against the door. And then I, had, I saw him from an anterior view and a lateral view. I said, just take your arms up slowly. And I want to see when you start to extend and, and get that back off the wall. And you can mm -hmm. see his ribs flare out. I mean, it, it was mm -hmm. like 100 degrees of shoulder flexion. Same thing from the side. You could see that the, the, just the tightness in the latch was preventing him. So I said, mm -hmm. if you, you're just, what you're doing is because you, lift the, you need to lift the weights above your head, you're feeding into that movement pattern of extension, of retraction, of that, that, that mm -hmm. rigidity in your upper back. That's just not making you better. So if you're doing shrugs in that position, you don't, you, you, that doesn't make any sense. That's why it, you know, it was just a teeny bit better. It's almost mm -hmm. the right exercise, but the wrong position. So yeah. I had him start on his back. I said, what I want you to do is I'm going to put one hand up in the air and just literally sort of shrug your shoulder and put it back. It's almost like reach up to the ceiling, shrug, and then put your arm down. I had him do it on both sides to get his scapula in a better position. And then I literally had him just do easy, um, uh, you know, arm lifts as far as he could go without arching his back. And then I was giving him cueing as to when to stop. Mm -hmm. Then I had him do just some, you know, a TheraBand wrapped around his forearm, just do some elbow lifts. I had him do... Um, uh, a little bit of just a little shoulder press, easy. Anything in front of his body or his scapula were already elevated. And that was the easiest position for him was on his back. So I said, the next progression for you is to go into a sitting, then into standing once you get that movement pattern down. Because lying on your back, you could easily just set your scapula, shrug up and back and just put down your scapula or set quote unquote air quotes here. And then you can do movements in front of your body that will encourage some upper rotation of your shoulder blade, that will encourage some elevation of your shoulder blade without you arching your back. And, and I, you need to, to be able to, 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 to understand when that's happening. And I gave him some cueing with imagery as well. Uh, the, the, float, the, shoulder, the, the floating shoulder blade imagery really helped with that. Mm -hmm. So I said, the first thing you do is do your all fours into like your lat release and then go into on your back and then just do some of these presses, you know, skull crushers, arm lifts in a supine position with your knees bent. Mm -hmm. So comments on that? Yeah, or? no, I like that. In fact, I can see a lot of progression for him, you know, in those types of situations, you know, he can even, uh, once he gets his uh, trunk uh, um, stronger and, and a little bit more, you know, a little bit better motor control where it's not just releasing and letting him go up, mm -hmm. you know, into that extended, you know, jet, which it's not even really, it's kind of funny. It's not even really extension. It's like jutting forward, right? It's, yes. it's like a shove forward of the, of the thorax it's instead like, of just like extension. Yeah. And yeah. it's, it's kind of an interesting thing to look at that from that direction because, you know, if he can get, you know, the, the lengthening of the multifidus and, you know, that lengthening stuff that you're doing with them is fantastic because that's going to help. But the other piece of that is, is that, you know, with that thorax and the way that it is, his cervical fascia must be so tight. Um, ah, good that, point. You know, because, and, you know, that, that wraps around the clavicles in the figure eight. And mm -hmm. when that cervical fascia has been in a shortened position for all that time for that you know ex excavatum you know thorax Texas excavatum yeah yeah uh it's a tongue twister but for that you know it you know that fascia has been in a shortened position and it's probably shortened over time mm. so it's hard to pull the chest down in the front so yes. he just juts forward in here and that's part of that whole down sloping because if he doesn't down slope his shoulders he's just gonna, it's gonna be hard to breathe he's gonna you know exactly so this guy cannot do cervical retraction exercises 
No. Because if he does, everything goes out the other way, you know? Yeah. So he did. Yeah. So that's like a, you know, that's not going to work. So I love that giving him those cues so he can begin to appropriately receptively get aware of if I start to allow my trunk to do this and I need to come back and really gain that motor control while he's doing things with his arms and they're meaningful because he can carry weights in his arms. So it's kind of like, it's getting yeah. him back to what he wants to do but he gets that he needs a new position and a new, a new pattern. Mm -hmm. But I could even see at some point where he can like lay on his back with his knees bent and actually pick his toes up off the floor. Mm, really engaging, yeah. you know, the, the deep uh, truncal muscles, yeah. all of them while he's doing it, you know, he yeah. can do, you know, in different positions as he gets stronger and yeah. he's able to control it. Cause there's a lot of cool things he can do. You know, he can even like hold the position with his arms up in kind of that partial skull crusher type position yeah. and then actually work on lifting legs up and down or maybe sliding them out or lifting them up and mm. pushing them out. You know, so he's got the kind of like both ends. Mm -hmm. um, it might be really kind of cool too to see if he could, you know, those long straps that are stretchy. Mm -hmm. To see if he could grab one of those with his hands and pull it up in that, again, that I call it skull crusher position, but you know, partially bent elbows, you know, partially flexed shoulders, you know, where the hands are going towards the head. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, but just kind of holding that, put his feet in there yeah. on the other end. Yeah. And then he's got, then he can kind of hold and control his trunk while his feet push out against Oh, resistance. yes. So yes. he could, you know, or he could go the other way. His feet could stay still and he could yeah. work his arms up. You know, so he's working both ends. And I like the abdominal. Yeah, and you could actually even bring in some rotation once he gets, you know, yeah. so there's some cool progressions you can do there Yeah. Uh, that I think will help a lot. But I love the whole idea of getting his back on a wall or his back on the floor so that he, because this is somebody who really needs to have that input. Yes. Until he can gain a sense of it himself. You know, once he gets it, he's a, it sounds like he's a smart kind of movement, you know, kid. He's somebody who's been moving all the time. Yeah. I mean, he's yeah. not a, he's not, it doesn't sound like he's a, uh, you know, a movement moron at all. It sounds no. like, you know, he picks up on it pretty quick and can adapt and he understands. Yeah. So, um, but that'll be kind of cool to see because that gives him that proprioceptive input. Mm -hmm. So he can, you know, so he can monitor the motor control that he needs to have to anchor that rib cage a little bit better. Yeah. Yeah. And then he's going to be more free to do that stuff that you wanted him to do with. I'm showing, I'm sorry, we're not on video. <laughs> I've got my elbows by, and my shoulders popping up and down, but he'll be freer to like let those scapula go. Yes. Um, when they, when they're not trying to hold on, you know, it seems to me that the scapula and the lats are trying to do something, yes. trying to stay, trying to stabilize, you know, and doing it through compression or something. I'm not sure what. Yep. Um, and, you know, it's just kind of interesting to me to see, yeah, I, bringing that other stuff in it's just like they've become the the big players on the playground and for whatever reason the truncal muscles aren't probably doing their job as well and it could be positional could be movement strategies that he's had all his life around this you know uh deal going on with his thorax mm -hmm. you know not yeah. sure but you know you, nevertheless it doesn't really matter if the chicken or the egg came first at this point he needs to really be able to control his thorax better so that he can load a little bit more appropriately yeah. and you know just let it and hang into extension or that jutting forward which is that relative extension down yeah. in that lower thorax where he had his issues yes you're going to load that heavy that's not you know you're going to have to be I, able to adjust the um <coughs> optimize the position so it can handle the load I know it's interesting because when I had him, yes, when I had him sitting with his back against the, the door and he, it was about a hundred degrees of shoulder flexion and all of a sudden the ribs were flaring. Like he could not, he was, he was literally with his, he was jutting for lack of a better word, his lower rib cage anterior, like almost like his interior translation because he could not, he had to give in, he, could, he couldn't give into that tightness. So that was his compensation. So I found that, um, that really interesting. And I think I did have him, I did have him cue his abdominals a little bit in those initial exercises, but I like the fact of adding the abdominals in at the same time when you're doing your upper extremity supine. So I, I, I like that little toe taps, little if I can get the TheraBand, have him do the TheraBand, that, that's really fascinating. So I will do that. And what I basically have, um, I, I see this a lot now, I'm just, especially in weightlifters. It's almost like this interior translation of the thorax versus extension. I agree with you. It's like, it's like they're just 
they're just jutting their chest out, you know, for lack of a better mm-hmm. word. Mm-hmm. And I like, so you mentioned the cervical fascia, mm-hmm. his clavicle. So for people who are like crazy, you know, biomechanists here, but his clavicles were so down sloped. I mean, the lateral end of his clavicle was like, normally they're horizontal. To high, his were like, 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 you know, following the line of the shoulder girdle. And mm-hmm. it, and that makes sense because how, he, he has to breathe, right? You know, mm-hmm. I, that makes complete sense with that cervical fascia. Uh, so that's why, like, I, I find this, this case fascinating and interesting because the strategy is so ingrained. Yeah, in him, yeah. And you can play well, with exercise to get him mm-hmm. out of that. Yeah, and he, you know, and part of it is genetically driven. Yeah. He just developed, his nervous system did exactly what it was supposed to do. It developed movement system patterns yeah around this you know this um you know i just hate the word deformity but around this yeah. this uh this chest wall um issue <laughs> deal, deal, yeah, deal that he has going on and his mother had it yeah so she probably looks very much like him yes you know I, as, I'm, I'm as assuming, in, yeah. in their movement you know and how they stand and you know there's always those tendencies as well and yeah. so of course you know he's in he's 20 so he's been developing this for most of his teenage life yes as he started growing taller and this started happening yes yes and you know and so it's not that he was taught wrong or was exercising wrong or doing anything wrong it's just that for him it's more problematic yeah and especially because he had this injury yes you know so there's you know so again it was working until it would till he was you know he loaded and it didn't work anymore Mm -hmm. you know the 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 lift the load was you know and it may be that his bones are normal and it was just abnormal forces on normal bone or or forces on abnormal bone bone. yeah i think we have to get into that a little bit again it cannot ignore the other pieces the digestive yes um issues the heart palpitation particularly the digestive issues because good gravy if he's not getting the stomach acid going he's not getting the bone mineralization he needs yes. and you know that that just needs to be dug into there i mean he needs to optimize that as best as he possibly can if he wants to do this kind of lifting but he needs it anyway this is him right now building the bone bank as much as he needs to get yeah i'm really so curious. these are the days that where he's building it and so optimize that bone bu- bone bank building as much as you can and what does the stomach acid have to do with that well the stomach so if if we have low stomach acid which you see uh, i see often with digestive problems yeah um when you have low stomach acid the uh cardiac sphincter which is the sphincter on top of the stomach will not close effectively giving people Mm -hmm. feelings of heartburn so they put them on these medicines is he on an is he on a proton pump inhibitor thank god good thank goodness don't let him get on one okay um but when we have low stomach acid the uh the food itself can't get digested all the way like it's supposed to Mm -hmm. and that in the stomach is where those minerals are absorbed for the bones and so we're not getting great mineralization that's why people on these proton pump inhibitors um, we're finding females have terrible bones you know, yeah. even in their, like, we're finding osteopenia in people's 30s from taking these drugs. Oh, wow. Wow. It's, they're not, they're not, they're good for little short-term things. If you've yeah. got, you know, whatever the disease is, you know, where, you know, you, uh, you know, where your esophagus is wearing away or something, then you may have to do something. But for the most part, the population, they just need to change how they're eating, for goodness sakes. Yeah. yeah. You know, and, um, but anyway, if he's got some digestive problems, my concern would be, um, you know, and especially in face of, you know, this genetic thing, and there could be an underlying autoimmunity that may or may not have expressed itself already, but maybe getting ready to, mm-hmm. we don't know. Um, I would just want to optimize that the best as possible so he could get all the minerals that he can possibly stand reabsorbed most optimally so that his bones will be able to have the building blocks they need, Yeah, you know, for him and the, and the muscles and the connective tissue and everything else. Yeah. But yeah. You know, like yeah, I said, I, as a 20 year old man, this is prime time for setting down that bone, especially in the spine. I know. I know. You know in those, he won. Just, that's that. Yeah. That's like the, you know, that the big transitional joint yeah. there, you know, for rotation. I, I know. I thought it's funny. I said to myself, he's too young to have a fracture there. I've certainly, yes, he was lifting a lot of weight and a lot of pe- many people lift weights and they don't have emulsion fractures. They just, I, you know, you they, almost they, expect that would. 
you know, with the forceful yeah. jump or some I mean, sort of forceful weights compression. to build bones. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so, so I find that fascinating and I will, um, you know, uh, cheap on him in terms of all the other things and, uh, as mm -hmm. well as the physician, uh, because I think it's probably, I, I think we need to do both. It's not, mm -hmm. I don't, you know, so, uh, but I, if he's otherwise healthy looking and, and things like that. So, but I, I, I just, I really find the exercise progression really interesting because he really was on like, why didn't it help? Why didn't this help? Like, because it was the wrong position and it was feeding into it. So it's almost like hindsight's 2020, but now I know why that didn't, that wasn't working because he was reinforcing this movement pattern that for whatever reason you, you just have, you know, and, and it's a product of your, your movements, your, your movement history, your genetics, you know, you're still growing, but I am actually looking forward to progressing him. Um, and I, I don't know if we'll ever be able to change this, this sort of like, you know, if anybody with that such a depressed shoulder girdle, if you'll ever mm -hmm. be able to get that fully, you know, corrected, so to speak. But I do believe that it, he'll, he'll get, he'll get significantly better. Oh, yeah, you know, absolutely. So. And no matter what he does in optimizing his digestion and everything else, you want to yeah. get him in a position where his, you know, where he can just load more optimally. Mm -hmm. You know, you want to make this good for him because this is something he wants to do. He wants to do. And, yeah. you know, we want to, you know, whether that's a faulty movement pattern on somebody else or not, doesn't matter for him. You know, it's not a movement pattern that's going to let him optimally lift that kind of weight. Yeah. And I just, you know, again, I like all the ways that you said the exercise he was doing wasn't wrong. He just needed to do them in a different position. position. He needed to, uh, he needed the input. And I love the other thing I just want to point out. So in case the, the listeners didn't catch it um, with him on all fours and then going back into child's pose, basically you're just rocking back onto your heels. Yeah. And that's just such a great way to watch what happens at the lumbar spine and yeah. what, ha you know, and what happens at the pelvis and the, and the hips, you mm -hmm. know, where does it, can the movement be broken up? Can it not? Did they just go into some sort of a full lumbar flexion pattern or not? And he didn't go into, it sounds like very much flexion at all. And, yeah. and it sounds like that his, um, and so she, you were talking a lot about the latissimus. And yeah. so the latissimus is over, you know, this is a case of maybe a muscle that isn't, it's maybe become tight over time, but this is a muscle that's working all the oh, time. Yeah. And exactly. it's hard for him to get in positions where it won't. So activating something else oftentimes can be the thing to change the input to the muscle that's overworking. Yeah. And that's why I liked, you know, just like, okay, instead of like just trying to make them stretch into that child's pose, just stretch, stretch, stretch. <laughs> it's like, let's flip you on your back and get you doing something different and see if yeah. we can make a difference in how that latissimus is responding and exactly. do the scapulas free up a bit. Yes. You know, yes. and does that take some of that tension pressure off the neck? Exactly. And I you like, know? I like that, that neck piece because I, I'm curious as to that cervical fascia. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 No, with uh, all fours, we did, uh, I rechecked it actually after I used it more, I said to him, I'm using this more as an objective assessment on my part, you know, and I, I had him just do some few, a few, like a few sets of some of the supine exercises, uh, you know, just little presses and lifts and, and things like that. And he was able to a little bit better. I mean, he's 20, so he's, he's able to sort of respond quick, quickly, mm -hmm. but it's funny because the minute he got up, I'm like, just, just, cause he was, um, I just said something like, you know, you're bending. I don't know what I, it was some cue that I gave him. And the minute he tr stood up straight, he went back to his old strategy. I'm like, mm -hmm. that's what we want to train you out of. Yeah. You know, it's like more mm -hmm. options for movement. So I think a light bulb went off in his head a little bit and he's like, Oh, I get that. You know? So, and, and it's helpful to, for me virtually, cause I screenshot and I take pictures and, and I, and, and, and sometimes I'll show the patient if they're, if they're willing and, Sometimes it mm -hmm. helps and sometimes it doesn't. It just depends on the person. So, right. But just but like the mirror, sometimes it helps, yeah. sometimes it doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. I think the main key with him before uh, we, we close off here is, is really the exercise positioning. It's so important. I mean, mm -hmm. anybody, you know, you, you can't miss his, his, what he, what's going on here. I mean, in terms of visual with his down depressed shoulder girdles, you know, and notwithstanding the autoimmune and the bone and the bone mineral density, I think that's all important. Uh, 
the, the position of the exercise is yeah. to keep somebody like that. And are you getting what you want? That's the whole thing. It's like, yeah. okay, doing shoulder shrugs, is he still, you know, if you're not, if you're only looking at the neck, you're not going to see the thorax move and you're not going to see the thorax connection into the thoracolumbar fascia for sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah. When you're seeing that shoulder kind of thing. So here's just a real quick thing you can check Erica when you have them again mm -hmm. is um, when I'm looking at that cervical fascia, mm -hmm. I just have them sit yep. and I have them do just a chin retraction, you know, the head retraction. Yep. And if you see that whole chest wall rise, yeah, and you know that they've got, a, and they're just—they're not going to be able to. They'll, they, they're not going to breathe well if you make them get into this position. But I loved what you did with him in the beginning because it's exactly what I would have done, which is have him lengthen. You mm -hmm. know, so you don't have to retract to get the lengthening. You can just mm -hmm. rise straight up. Yeah, you know, and um, that really actually activates the multifidi much better. Yeah, um, yes. than than doing retraction exercises doesn't, and with him. It's not going to do anything, you yeah. know, because it's just going to yeah. pull his chest up. You'll see it. It'll just yeah. jut it out. Yeah. And so, you know, uh, you know, and I know people take people like that and they have neck pain and boom, they start getting, doing all these retraction exercises Oh no! and it doesn't yeah. help at all. And in fact, yeah. sometimes it feeds into some more problems. So yeah. kind of like, look at what you're doing when you ask people to exercise or to move and see if it's the intended thing that you want. Because oftentimes if you look at it and look at them in its entirety, like you did, then you're like, oh, why are you doing that? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Let's change the position and see yeah. if we can't get this, you know, make sure that what you're asking is getting a change that, that uh, is going to be, you know, helpful for the patient's movement system. Right. And I think, you know, I think that's what I was telling him. I said, um, at the end of the day, you know, people, you look at your downslope shoulders and people just give shrugs. I mean, that, that's you just, just not going to help. I, I get yeah. that. It's the obvious thing. But you need to really focus on his movement pattern. That's the important, not something static, although that was so obvious. But, but how is he moving into that position? A lot right. of people have downslope shoulders and have walk around pain free. You know, it's, yeah. his, it's, the, it's the strategy. Can he move out of that position? he really can't, you mm -hmm. know, w without real cueing right now. So that's the key. And I think that's why I think the progression in terms of positioning is so important with people like this, because they have such ingrained, well, people, general, mm -hmm. people, you know, patients who have ingrained movement patterns, but the positioning of the exercises is so important. Yeah. And that's my final words. Okay. <laughs> I hope everybody Bye. enjoyed it. Thank you. Take care, Thank everybody. You. Thank you. Bye. Enjoy.